Hey, what up? Today we're going to be looking at Chapter 23, Injuries to the Head, Neck, and Spine. Let's get started. Although injuries to the head, neck, and spine account for only a small percentage of all injuries, they cause more than half of the fatalities. Each year, nearly 2 million Americans suffer a head, neck, or spinal injury serious enough to require medical care. Most of those injured are males between the ages of 15 and 30. Motor vehicle collisions account for about half of all head, neck, and spinal injuries. Other causes include falls, sports-related mishaps, accidents related to recreational activities, and violent acts, such as assault. Besides those who die each year in the United States from head, neck, and spinal injury, nearly 80,000 people become permanently disabled. These survivors have a wide range of physical and mental impairments, including paralysis, speech and memory problems, and behavioral disorders. Fortunately, prompt appropriate care can help minimize the damage from most head, neck, and spinal injuries. In this chapter, you will learn how to recognize when a head, neck, or spinal injury may be serious. You will also learn to provide appropriate care to minimize these injuries. The head contains special sense organs, the brain, mouth, and related structures. The head is formed by the skull and face. The four flat bones of the skull are fused together to form a hollow shell. This hollow shell, the cranial cavity, contains the brain. The face is on the front of the skull. The bones of the face include the bones of the cheek, forehead, nose, and jaw. The neck contains the esophagus, larynx, and part of the trachea. It also contains major blood vessels, muscles, and tendons, and the cervical bones of the spine. The back is made up of soft tissue, bones, cartilage, nerves, muscles, tendons, and ligaments. It supports the skull, shoulder bones, ribs, and pelvis, and protects the spinal cord and other vital organs. The head is easily injured because it lacks padding of muscle and fat that are found in other areas of the body. The most common cause of death in patients with head injuries is a lack of oxygen to the brain. Also, swelling of the brain, tissues, or bleeding within the brain can cause increased pressure inside the skull that, in turn, can cause damage to the brain. A brain injury may lead to altered consciousness with airway and breathing problems. The two types of head injury are open and closed. Open head injuries involve a break in the skull or occur when an object penetrates the skull. There is direct damage to the skull and brain damage may be involved. Head injuries bleed profusely and a patient may lose blood quickly. With open head injuries, it's important that you control bleeding promptly with dressings, direct pressure, and a pressure bandage while restricting spinal movement. Do not apply direct pressure over where there is an obvious skull fracture or depression. Do not remove any penetrating object. Instead, stabilize it with thick dressings. Closed head injuries occur when the brain is struck against the skull, but the skull remains intact. They can also occur from impact with a blunt object. This type of injury may be more challenging to detect as there may not be any visible damage to the skull, although in some cases swelling or depression is evident. In addition to the general signs of a head injury, there may be a softness or depression on the skull and blood or cerebral spinal fluid may be leaking from the nose or ears. If you suspect a closed head injury, do not control bleeding using direct pressure as this could further cause injury by pushing bone fragments into the brain. Because of the rigid nature of the skull, if swelling or bleeding in the brain occurs, brain damage may occur depending on the nature and force of the injury. You should suspect a skull fracture any time there has been significant trauma to the head, even if the patient has suffered a closed head injury. Skull fractures may be accompanied by brain damage, caused by bleeding or swelling within the brain, which is a life-threatening condition. If the patient is showing any signs of head injury, a skull fracture may be present and brain injury is possible. A patient with a skull injury should be seen by a more advanced medical professional immediately. The signs and symptoms of a skull fracture with brain injury include damage to the skull including deformity to the skull or face, pain or swelling at the site of the injury, blood or other fluids leaking from the mouth, nose, ears, or a scalp wound, unequal facial movements, drooping, unequal or unresponsive pupils, or vision problems in one or both eyes, bruising around the eyes, raccoon eyes, bruising behind the ear, battle signs. A concussion is a temporary loss of brain function caused by a blow to the head. It is considered a brain injury, although there may be no detectable damage to the brain. A person who suffers a concussion may not always lose consciousness. 
Concussions are classified from mild to severe, depending on how long it takes the patient to become responsive. However, no matter how mild it may seem, every suspected concussion should be treated seriously. The effects of a concussion can appear immediately or very soon after the blow to the head occurs. Symptoms can last for days or even longer. Other symptoms may not appear for hours or even days, including mood and cognitive disturbances, sensitivity to light and noise, and sleep disturbances. The signs and symptoms of a concussion include confusion, which may last from moments to several minutes, headache, repeated questioning about what happened, temporary memory loss, especially for periods immediately before and after the injury, brief losses of consciousness, nausea and vomiting, speech problems, where the patient is unable to answer questions or obey simple commands, and or blurred vision or light sensitivity. The mortality rate from a concussion is almost zero, and patients usually recover quickly. However, a patient with a suspected concussion should be seen by a medical professional promptly to ensure that the injury is not more serious. The risk of permanent brain damage caused by repeated concussions is significant. An athlete should not be allowed to return to play until advised it is okay to do so by a healthcare provider. If an object such as a bullet, knife, or nail passes through the skull and lodges in the brain, it is considered a penetrating wound. Penetrating wounds can cause long-term damage. Do not try to remove an object that is impaled in the skull. Stabilize the object and the wound site with bulky dressings and then dress the surrounding area with sterile gauze. If you suspect an object has penetrated the skull, but it's not visible, cover the area lightly with sterile dressings. Never apply firm, direct pressure to a head injury that shows bone fragments, exposed brain tissue, or where depression is visible. Do not stop the flow of blood or cerebral spinal fluid draining from the ears or nose. Apply loose gauze dressings. Keep the patient still and minimize movement of the head and neck. Scalp bleeding can be minor or severe. A scalp injury may bleed more than expected due to the large number of blood vessels in the scalp. The bleeding is usually easily controlled with direct pressure. Because the skull may be injured, be careful to press gently at first. If you feel a depression, a spongy area, or bone fragments, do not put direct pressure on the wound. Attempt to control bleeding with pressure on the area around the wound. Examine the injured area carefully because the patient's hair may hide part of the wound. If you are unsure about the extent of the scalp injury, summon more advanced medical personnel who will be better able to evaluate the injury. Severe bleeding from the scalp can cause shock in young children and infants. Once bleeding is controlled, apply several dressings and hold them in place with a gloved hand. Secure the dressings with a roller bandage. Use a pressure bandage if necessary. Some of the typical signs and symptoms of head and brain injury include the following. Damage to the skull, including deformity to the skull or face. Pain or swelling at the site of the injury. Irregular breathing. A sudden debilitating headache. Nausea or vomiting. Incontinence, which is involuntary urination or defecation. High blood pressure or slowed pulse. Paralysis or droopiness, often on one side of the body. Rigidity of limbs. Loss of balance. Asymmetrical facial movements. Confusion, unresponsiveness or other type of altered mental state. Facial bruising, including raccoon eyes, visible bruising around your eyes. External bleeding of the head. Unusual bumps or depressions on the head. Blood or other fluids draining from the ears, mouth, or nose. Bruising behind the ears. Battle signs. Unequal pupil size and unresponsive pupils. Disturbance of vision in one eye or both. Speech problems or seizures. Your first step should be to summon more advanced medical care. Making sure to follow standard precautions to prevent disease transmission, provide the following care while waiting for more advanced medical personnel to arrive. Establish manual stabilization of the head and neck. Perform a primary assessment and maintain manual stabilization while on the scene. Maintain an open airway. Monitor the airway, suction if needed, and administer emergency oxygen if available. Control any bleeding and apply dressings to any open wounds. Do not apply direct pressure if there is any signs of an obvious skull fracture. If there is leaking of cerebral spinal fluid from the ears or a wound in the scalp, cover the area loosely with a sterile gauze dressing. 
Do not attempt to remove any penetrating object. Instead, stabilize it with a bulky dressing. Maintain manual stabilization until other emergency medical services responders relieve you and immobilize a patient on a backboard. If you are trained to do so and protocols allow, apply a cervical collar, also called a C-collar. Monitor the patient's vital signs and mental status closely and watch for any changes in the patient's status. Try to calm and reassure the patient. Encourage the patient to engage in conversation with you. It may prevent a loss of consciousness. Nose injuries often result from a blow by a blunt object. A broken nose may be deformed and will swell. Nosebleeds can also be caused by dryness and high blood pressure. Nosebleeds can be painful or the nose may be tender. There can be bleeding only from the nose or the patient could vomit swallowed blood. If the patient is unresponsive, the airway can become blocked by blood. Care for soft tissue injuries to the nose as you would other soft tissue injuries. Apply cold packs to reduce swelling and take special care to maintain an open airway. You can usually control bleeding by having the patient sit with their head slightly forward while pinching the nostrils together for about 10 minutes. Alternatively, you can apply an ice pack to the bridge of the nose or put pressure on the upper lip just beneath the nose if there is no trauma to the mouth, teeth, or upper jaw. Ice should not be applied directly to the skin as it can damage the skin tissue. Place a cloth between the ice and the skin. Advanced medical care is needed if the bleeding does not stop, recurs, or if the patient has a history of high blood pressure. Tell the patient not to sniffle or blow his or her nose. If the patient loses consciousness, place the patient on the side to allow the blood to drain away from their airway. Children may have objects in their nose. Do not attempt removal, as special lighting and instruments may be required. Reassure the child and parent and call for more advanced medical personnel. Injuries to the eye can involve the eyeball, the bone, and the soft tissue surrounding the eye. Blunt objects like a fist or a baseball may injure the eye and surrounding area or a smaller object may penetrate the eyeball. Care for the open and closed wounds around the eye as you would for any other soft tissue injury. Injuries to the eyeball itself require different care. Injuries that penetrate the eyeball or cause the eye to be removed from the socket are very serious and can cause blindness. Never put direct pressure on the eyeball. Remember that all eye injuries should be examined by a healthcare provider. It is not necessary to cover both the injured and the uninjured eyes because sympathetic and involuntary eye movement occurs even when both eyes are covered and not exposed to outside stimuli. Covering both eyes can also cause fear and increase anxiety, especially in children, and pose a safety risk to the patient. To assess what type of care the patient will need, first determine when the injury occurred, whether one or both eyes were injured, and when the patient first noticed the symptoms. Then, using a small pen light, follow these guidelines. Check the eye sockets and eyelids for bruising, lacerations, swelling, or deformity. Check the whites of the eyes for foreign objects, discoloration, or discharge. Check that the eyes can move in all directions and that the pupils react equally to light and ensure there's no pain when the eyes move. Check that the pupils are equal in size and check that there are no lacerations or foreign objects in the eyeballs. Foreign bodies that get in the eye, such as dirt or slivers of wood or metal, are irritating, painful, and can cause significant damage to the cornea. It is important to tell the patient not to rub the eyes. Never touch the eye and always follow standard precautions when caring for the patient. If you determine there is a foreign body in the eye, try to remove it by telling the patient to blink several times. If the object is visible on the lower eyelid, pull the eyelid down, try to remove the object with the corner of a sterile gauze pad. Be careful not to touch the eyeball. Next, gently flush the eye with irrigation, saline solution, or water. After irrigating, if the object is visible on the upper eyelid, gently roll the upper eyelid back over a cotton swab and attempt to remove the object with the corner of a sterile gauze pad, being careful not to touch the eyeball. If the object remains, the patient should receive advanced medical care. Cover the injured eye with an eye pad or a shield. If chemicals have been in contact with the patient's eyes, irrigate the affected eye or eyes with clean water for at least 20 minutes. If only one eye is affected, make sure you do not let the water run into the unaffected eye. Continue care while transporting the patient if you can.
Do not attempt to remove an object that is impaled in the eye. Keep the patient in a face-up position and enlist someone to help stabilize the patient's head. Stabilize the object by encircling the eye with gauze, dressing, or a soft sterile cloth, being careful not to apply any pressure to the area. Position bulky dressings around the impaled object, such as roller gauze, and then cover it up with a shield, such as a paper cup. Do not use a styrofoam type cup, as particles or small particles can break off and get into the eye. The shield should not touch the object. Bandage the shield and dressing in place with a self-adhering bandage and roller bandage covering the patient's injured eye to keep the object stable and minimize movement. Comfort and reassure the patient. Do not leave the patient unattended. Patients with facial injuries may have injuries to the teeth or jaws. Situations that fracture or dislocate the jaw can also cause head, neck, or spinal injuries. Maintaining an open and clear airway and restricting spinal motion should be priorities. The signs and symptoms of oral injuries include teeth that do not meet or are uneven, loose, or missing, a patient who is unable to open or close their mouth, saliva mixed with blood, pain in areas around the ears, and difficulty or pain when speaking. If the patient is bleeding from the mouth and a head, neck, or spinal injury is not suspected, place the patient in a seated position with the head tilted slightly forward or on the side to allow any blood to drain from the mouth. If the injury has penetrated the lip, place a rolled dressing between the lip and the gum and another dressing on the outer surface of the lip. If the tongue is bleeding, apply a dressing and direct pressure. Cold compress may alleviate pain and swelling. If the injury has knocked out a tooth, try to find it. Handle the tooth by the crown Rinse it gently under running water and place it in a glass of milk. If milk is not available, place the tooth in clean water or moisten sterile gauze. If the patient is conscious and able to cooperate, rinse out the mouth with cold tap water if available. Control the bleeding by placing a rolled sterile dressing into place left by the missing tooth. Have the patient gently bite down to maintain pressure. Do not try to reimplant the tooth yourself. Do not allow the tooth to dry out. Contact a dentist or bring the tooth and the patient to an emergency care center as soon as possible. Leave intact dentures in position to support the mouth structure. Remove broken dentures and send them with the patient to assist the oral surgeon with jaw alignment. Injuries to the neck or spine can damage both bone and soft tissue, including the spinal cord. It is difficult to determine the extent of damage in neck or spinal injuries. Since generally only x-rays, computerized tomography scans, or magnetic resonance imaging scans can show the severity of these injuries, you should always care for them as if they are serious. Consider the possibility of a serious neck or spinal injury in a number of situations. These may include any injury caused by entry into shallow water, injury as a result of a fall greater than a standing height, an injury involving a diving board, water slide, or entering water from a significant height such as an embarkment, cliff, or tower. An injury such as from a car or other vehicle collision involving severe blunt force to the person's head or trunk. A motor vehicle, motorized cycle, or bicycle collision involving a pedestrian or driver or passengers not wearing safety belts or one that results in a broken windshield or deformed steering wheel. Injury as the result of a hanging any unresponsive trauma patient, injury involving a penetrating trauma to the head, neck, or torso, any person thrown from a motor vehicle, any injury in which a patient's industrial hard hat or helmet is broken, including a motorcycle, bicycle, football, or other sports helmet, a person who has had other painful injuries, especially of the head and neck, a person complaining of neck or back pain or tenderness, tingling in the extremities, or weakness. An injured person who appears to be frail or over 65 years of age. A person who is not fully alert or appears to be intoxicated. Someone with an obvious head injury or neck injury. Has sensory deficit or muscle weakness involving the torso or upper extremities. Or its children less than 3 years of age with evidence of head and neck trauma. The carotid artery and jugular vein are both located in the neck, and injuries to one or both will produce serious, possibly fatal, bleeding. 
an open wound in the neck may result in an air embolism, which is caused by air being sucked into the wound. A fractured larynx or collapsed trachea is also a common neck injury. If the laceration is caused by an object impaled in the neck, do not attempt to remove it. The signs and symptoms of neck injuries include obvious laceration, swelling, or bruising, obvious impalement to the neck, profuse external bleeding, impaired breathing as a result of the injury, difficulty speaking, or complete loss of voice, a crackling sound when the patient is speaking or breathing due to air escaping from the injured trachea or larynx, obstructed airway caused by swelling of the throat, the signs and symptoms of spinal injuries may include pain or pressure in the back independent of movement or palpation, tenderness in the area of the injury, pain associated with moving, numbness, weakness, tingling, or loss of feeling or movement in the extremities, partial or complete loss of movement or feeling below the suspected level of injury, difficulty breathing or shallow breathing, or loss of bladder and or bowel control. If the patient can walk, move, and has feeling in the arms and legs, it does not necessarily rule out the possibility of injury to the bones of the spine or to the spinal cord. If you suspect a patient has a neck or spinal injury, restrict spinal motion and control any bleeding. Do not move the patient or ask the patient to move to try to find a painful response. It is essential when treating neck injuries to maintain an open airway. If the patient is wearing a helmet, do not remove it unless you've been trained to do so or unless there is necessary to access and assess the patient's airway. Because movement of an injured neck or spine can irreversibly damage the spinal cord, keep the patient still. To restrict spinal motion, use manual stabilization. Perform a primary assessment on the scene while maintaining manual stabilization. Assess the patient's pulse, movement, and feeling in the extremities. Approach patients from the front so that they can see you without turning their heads and tell patients to respond verbally to your questions. Ask the responsive patient the following questions while maintaining manual stabilization to further assess the situation. Does your neck or back hurt? What happened? Where does it hurt? Can you move your hands and feet? Can you feel where I am touching? For an unresponsive patient, maintain an open airway using a jaw thrust without head extension maneuver and assist ventilation if needed. You should not attempt to align the head and neck with the body unless you cannot maintain an open airway. You need to remove a helmet or you need to assist with the application of a cervical collar. Administer emergency oxygen if it's available. While obtaining further information, manually stabilize the head and neck in the position in which it was found. Obtain any further information from others at the scene to determine mechanism of injury and the patient's mental status before your arrival. Keeping the head, neck, and spine from moving, spinal motion restriction, helps prevent further damage to the spinal column. If a second rescuer is available, that person can provide care for any other conditions while you keep the head and neck stable. Assist more, med more advanced medical personnel upon arrival by maintaining manual stabilization. More advanced medical personnel will then apply a cervical collar to further immobilize the head and neck. If you must move the patient, secure the patient to a backboard prior to moving. When you encounter a patient who has sustained injuries while wearing a helmet, you must assess whether it's necessary to remove the helmet. As always, assess breathing and pulse and determine your course of action. Since properly fitted helmets fit snugly to the head, it is difficult to remove one without moving the patient's head and neck. Removing a helmet requires a minimum of two rescuers. When providing care to a patient with a helmet, you should only remove it if it's impeding your care, you are unable to access and assess the airway, or if the patient is in cardiac arrest. Otherwise, do not try to remove it. If the patient is breathing and the airway is clear, maintain manual stabilization with the helmet in place. Some helmets are closed in the front with face protectors. If the protector cannot be lifted out of the way, it is preferable that it be cut off rather than the helmet removed. Situations may require re removing the helmet, which include you cannot access or assess the patient's airway and breathing, the airway is impeded and cannot be opened with the helmet on, the patient is in cardiac arrest, or you cannot immobilize the spine. If a helmet is loose, this does not necessarily mean you must remove it. Try to stabilize the helmet by adding padding between the helmet and the patient's head. While some injuries are unavoidable, 
many others are preventable by being aware of potential dangers in the environment and taking appropriate safety measures. To prevent head, neck, and spinal injuries, take the following steps. Know your risk. Be aware of your surroundings and wear appropriate safety equipment and protective devices such as padding, footwear, helmets, and eye protection. Do not dive into a body of water if you are unsure of the depth. Wear your seatbelt in a motor vehicle. Insist that passengers wear seatbelts and always transport children in approved child safety seats in the back of the vehicle according to state and local regulations. To prevent falls, safety proof your home and workplace. Ensure that hallways and stairways are well lit and stairways have handrails. Always use a step stool or a step ladder to reach objects out of reach. Do not attempt to pull heavy objects that are out of reach over your head. Use good lifting techniques when lifting and carrying objects. Use non-slip treads on carpet or stairways and secure any area rugs with double-sided tape. Use non-slip mats in the bathtub or install handrails. And know your risk for osteoporosis, which is a bone disease responsible for many spine, hip, wrist, and other fractures. Make sure you have enough calcium in your diet and engage in weight-bearing exercises like walking or weight training to increase bone density and stimulate new bone formation. In this chapter, you learned how to recognize and care for serious head, neck, and spinal injuries. To decide whether an injury is serious, you must consider its cause. Often the cause is the best indicator of whether an injury to the head, neck, or spine should be considered serious. You must also carefully assess the signs and symptoms. If you ever have any doubts about the seriousness of an injury, then summon more advanced medical personnel. Like injuries elsewhere on the body, injuries to the head, neck, and spine often involve both soft and bone tissue. Control bleeding as necessary, usually with direct pressure on the wound. With scalp injuries, however, be careful not to apply pressure to a skull fracture. With eye injuries, remember not to apply pressure on the eyeball. If you suspect that a patient may have a serious head, neck, or spinal injury, minimize movement to the injured area when providing care. Minimizing movement is best accomplished by manual stabilization. Administer emergency oxygen if it's available. Apply a cervical collar and secure the patient to a backboard if you must move the patient if you are trained to do so, and local protocols allow. Many injuries are preventable if simple safety precautions are followed. Know your risks and mitigate your danger of injury. Be sure not to leave behind all the awesome skills at the end of the chapter. We've got manual stabilization here on page 518. We've got controlling bleeding from an open head wound here on 519. Over here on 520, we've got bandaging an eye with an injury from an impaled object. Ooh. And over here on 521, we've got caring for foreign bodies in the eye. Oh, how exciting. And just beyond that, we get to wrap it up with some enrichment. Some wonderful enrichment today. We've got how to remove a motorcycle helmet um, on page 522 and 523. Right behind that, we've got how to remove uh, helmets and other equipment continued on the back, and this is how to remove sporting helmets. Um, after that, we have enrichment on cervical collars and backboarding, so how to apply C-collars and step-by-step -step instructions on getting somebody onto a backboard. And we did go through injuries to the head, neck, and spine fairly quickly, so be sure if you have any questions to leave a comment. Hey, thank you so much for joining me today in the assessment, providing care, and prevention of the injuries to the head, neck, and spine. You all have a wonderful day, be good people, do good things, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!